Hi, good morning, everyone. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about a project we've been doing at MSSL, as we like to call it. So what we've been doing is mapping uh, biogenic, abiogenic, and thermogenic methane using the satellites GOSAT, that one, and ACE, that one, uh, in order to uh, via the retrievals of sorry, uh, methane and ethane. So what we're aiming is to generate a sort of a global map of where these biogenic sources are. So that wasn't that way. Sorry, yep, sorry, that wasn't in the original slides. Uh, that way. So. Um, a quick recap on what a biogenic and thermogenic methane means is that biogenic methane comes from bacterial actions, rice fields, cows, that sort of thing, <laughs> while uh, in, uh, abiogenic methane is usually shown from industry, cars, that sort of source, while thermogenic methane tends to be formed under high pressure and temperature in matter for under the earth and then gets released from mud volcanoes and that sort of thing. So going back quickly. So mapping methane. It's not new. Uh, this is a, uh, some data shown from GOSAT taken a couple of years ago, a month average. Here we can see methane, especially high around, say, bits of China and bits of India. So what is new is the ability to actually tell whether these are from industrial sources or cities, that sort of thing, or biological sources that we might see more in the rainforests over here. So how do we do this? So there were two methods we were employing for this. The first being via the use of what are called isotopologues. I took some convincing that that is actually a word in the English language, and I'm still not quite sure about that. Um, but yes, yeah, so the key ones we're using here are carbon-12 methane and carbon-13 methane. Now, carbon-12 methane makes up about 98% of atmospheric methane, while carbon-13 methane is about 1.1%. So we're going to be using a ratio of these two in order to determine what the source of the methane is. I'll show you more about that on the next slide. Uh, what we can also use in the second um, method is via sympathetic ethane changes. Now what I'm showing here are some results taken by the Picaro Corporation using one of their cavity ring down spectrometers, which was some uh, measurements taken over Utah over a known biological source. Now we can see here uh, over the biological source there's the obviously in increase in methane. And along with this, there's a sympathetic increase in ethane. Now, there's a measurable known ratio of over biological source of methane to ethane, which is about 1,000 to 1. So using this, and um, we can see here that uh, this is a nice little figure showing how we can split up the different types of methane. So the scale here, go for, going from 0, more or less shows the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And the decreasing amount shows that we're increasing a decreasing amount of carbon-13 in relation to carbon-12 from a normal source. So we can see here that the biological methane tends to occupy the left side of this from about minus 50 to minus 90, while the abiogenic methane is, again, from about minus 50 all the way up to zero. So it's th using these sort of rela relationships and ratios that we can more or less definitively say if it's a biological source or not a biological source. So just a, a little cap about the instruments we're using here. So the first one we're using is the ACE satellite with a key instrument, the Fourier transform spectrometer. Now ACE is an interesting little satellite because instead of looking down at the Earth, it takes what are called limb profiles, which are taking slices of the atmosphere, which gives us a very nice vertical profile of the atmosphere all the way down to about five kilometers. Um, the, one of the more important aspects of ACE is the spectral resolution of about 0.02 centimeters. Now, um, well, sorry, wave numbers. Now, this becomes key when it comes to finding carbon-13, as the spectral lines of carbon-13 tend to be very close to the carbon-12, and we need that resolution to be able to pick them out. Now, the other important part of ACE is the infrared radiation, uh, the radiation range is sensitive to, which is from about 2.2 to 13.3 micrometers, which covers most of the main bands with, uh, where methane has absorption windows. The second instrument is the GOSAT. Again, we're using a Fourier transform spectrometer. Now, GOSAT is a Japanese satellite launched by JAXA. And instead of taking limb soundings, this takes uh, vertical profiles, which allows to generate the map that you saw earlier in the figure. And the key issue here, again, is that it has not as high resolution as the ACE satellite of about 0.2. Now, this comes key, as I'll show in some figures later, when picking out carbon-13. And instead of having a total range of radiation sensitive to, it has a number of bands. The key ones here are the 1.65 micrometers and the 7.8. 
Now I'm going to show you some results of our feasibility study on picking out these biological signatures, mostly in the thermal infrared range, due to the fact that GOSAT and ACE are both sensitive to them. So the key simulation tools we've been using here are the High Resolution Transmission or HITRAN database, which is a uh, database of spectral lines across the whole of the EM spectrum of about 50 molecules. This is freely available. We can download it if you like. Um, it tells us uh, the spectral lines of the isotopologues, which is incredibly useful for this at very, very high resolution. This tends to be updated every couple of years. I'm using the Hytran 2012. I believe there's one coming out in, in 2016, the updated one. However, the, the unfortunate fact about Hytran is it doesn't particularly simulate the atmosphere very well, which means that we can't see all the effects of uh, broadening due to uh, pressure or temperature, that sort of thing, which are very important when it comes to picking out spectral lines. So to, uh, to simulate this, we've been using the Oxford Reference Forward model, which is a radiative transfer model, one of the many available around. Uh, this was developed at the University of Oxford and, uh, and has a very useful capacity to be able to integrate the HITRAN database in it so we can actually simulate the broadening effects through the whole atmosphere on these isotopic lines. So now I'm going to be showing you some data for, taken from the HITRAN database. Now here we are seeing in the spectral range of about 8 micrometers to about 8.2 micrometers, which is slap bang in the thermal range. Now first we're looking at methane lines. Now we can see here a number of the key absorbing gases in this region, primarily NO2 in the sort of brownish, the green being water vapor, and the cyan being carbon-12, and the blue being carbon-13. And you can see carbon-13 is largely obscured in this range by all these atmospheric gases, apart from these points here, which um, shows that they, these are the strongest absorbers in the region, which means that hopefully we should be able to pick these out with a very fine spectral uh, for a transform spectrometer. Now, if we go on to ethane in a slightly shorter wave range, this is a scale is in wave numbers rather than in wavelengths, but this is around six micrometers. Now, we can see here a number of the key absorbing gases here. Again, water vapor in red, green is ethane here, um, cyan is NO2, and blue represents methane in, as a whole. Now, we can see that in the HITRAN database, that ethane is the strongest absorber across most of the spectrum. But when it comes to simulating the atmosphere, we'll see that this is not quite the case. So now moving on to the Oxford Reference Forward model, we can see here that um, I've got background methane concentration simulated against 20 parts per million volume concentrated for the GOSAT satellite. Now, unfortunately, we can see here that uh, carbon-13 lines are largely obscured by all the other trace gases or the key absorbing gases in the region, which have all been cobbled together into one nice line here. Again, carbon-12, nitrogen dioxide, and water vapor. This is a very frustrating result, as it means that we won't be able to globally map carbon-13 lines at any uh, concentration around the world, as we won't be able to physically pick them out. However, you can see on the right, if we do increase the concentration, as you might find in some form of a seep, uh, that yes, there are some lines, just barely, where you can pick them out. It's important to remember that this is the lower resolution for a transform spectrometer as compared to ACE, where you can see a bit more due to the resolution of the spectrum. But again, the key issue here is just the concentration. Now, if we increase the concentration more, we're likely to see more points we can pick it out. But um, this is not a particularly useful exercise right at this point. Moving on to the uh, ACE satellite. Now you can see I've taken two simulations here, one at a five kilometer altitude limb profile, one at a um, 20 kilometer altitude limb profile. Now we can see here on the left that at five kilometers that due to the slightly less uh, lower presence of, say, water vapor up at five kilometers, there are more spectral lines. We can see carbon-13, and these becomes even more prevalent at 20 kilometers, where the other atmospheric gases are just at a lower concentration. That, but therefore, carbon-13 lines are more likely to see. So this shows that in for carbon isotopologues, we should, at most concentrations and around the globe, be able to form up a good vertical profile of it, as compared to GOSAT, where we won't be able to form a global map, unfortunately. 
Now moving on to ethane. Now it's um, interesting that unfortunately, if you remember the high trans results showed earlier, this is ethane here. This is just the background um, gases at this, this wavelength. Unfortunately, it's just completely obscured once you look through the whole atmosphere, even if you increase the ethane concentration to ridiculously high con uh, values. It's just not possible. But again, this is really quite a disappointing result and takes away our secondary method for determining it. Now, if we consider the ACE satellite, even when we uh, have lower background gases available, um, again, at five kilometers, no chance. Even at 20 kilometers, uh, there's just not enough ethane concentration to be able to do it at backgrounds. However, if we, again, increase for ACE, increase the concentration to, say, two parts per million volume, which, again, is, frankly, a ridiculous amount of concentration, especially at these altitudes, it is only at 20 kilometers with a two-point parts per million volume concentration that we can actually see it. So, in conclusion, it is clear that um, we can see isotopolog lines in the thermal region for GOSAT and ACE. Unfortunately, we won't be able to make a global map in the thermal region from GOSAT, but we should be able to get a good vertical profile. But for ethane, it's frankly not really workable in any sense of the word. And finally, thanks to the RSP SOC and IGAC and the other developers of various tools I've been using on my assessment. And that's that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. And I should have said before that Edward is another one of our young scientists. So thank you very much. Any questions? Up there. I was impressed very much by your talk. And uh, my question is, I'm sorry, I didn't follow up the conclusion and the final conclusion. So did, do you? In your conclusion, you say that it, it is not possible to identify isotope. Is it right? No, I'm saying right? I'm saying it is possible to. Possible or impossible? I, I'm confusing. So, uh, will, will you say, so again, please? So yes, so it, it is possible to map carbon-13 isotopolog lines, but it's difficult in the GOSAT region where you require enough concentration to be able to map these seeps. But from ACE, it's much easier because you can do it from background concentrations. So basically, I'm saying in thermal region, it's difficult but possible. But but ACE and GOSET is not, you know, in the same direction. No, they're not. So we're doing slightly different things of ACE building up a vertical profile, GOSAT forming a uh, more ground level. So with GOSAT, we won't be able to form up a, a map like we saw earlier. Uh, I'll just go back quickly. Something yes, like yes, that. I, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Okay. Yeah. 